Right. So let's talk today about erosion control in this set segment of, of these three workshops, erosion control. Now, this is where we get um, some confusion too. It's like, well, wait a minute, weren't we talking about erosion control last hour? You know, we had fiber rolls and silt fence. Well, hopefully now you know that's sediment control. And when we talk about erosion and sediment control plans, they're two different things. Now, unfortunately, and I get it, it's just out of convenience. We call everything erosion control. Yeah, you know, some of us say, well, you don't have any erosion control measures there. I don't see any silt fence or fiber rolls. Well, technically that's sediment control, but I get it. We use that just to, you know, to uh, maybe make it convenient and we lump it all under erosion control. But I do want you to go away from these workshops, understanding that there are not only different tools we use, but there's different compartments of our toolbox and that we pull from them uh, for different purposes. So in this talk, we're gonna be talking about erosion controls and what we do with those. So again, let's start with the two perspectives. Let's start first with a construction general permit, the CGP. And it requires that dischargers shall provide effective soil cover. Now, did you hear that phrase? It didn't say erosion control measures. It said effective soil cover. It actually gets to the heart of what an erosion control measure is all about. It's about a soil cover that's effective. So obviously bare soil is not is, is no, no erosion control at all. Uh, but not only do we want to cover the soil, but we want to do it effectively. And so discharges shall provide effective soil cover for inactive areas. And that's where most people put a period after the word areas. That's where they stop. In fact, I've how many times have maybe you've been on a job site or, or you know, I've heard it a, a million times. They'll they'll put a period there, then they'll jump down to the footnote, which is in the yellow font down at the bottom, and says, Yeah, and an inactive area is an area of construction uh, that has been disturbed, but it's not scheduled to be redisturbed in 14 days. And I got 14 days before I need to do an erosion control measure. Well, maybe, but first off, there's no period after the word areas. It's followed by the word and. So it is true, dischargers shall provide an effective soil cover for inactive areas and all finished slopes. So the moment I get done with a slope, I don't got 14 days. I need to have an effective soil cover. Open spaces, what are those? Well, those are various things. It could be a staging area we're no longer using. It could be an area that we grubbed and devegetated early on in the project, but we're really not touching. It could be a, an area that will be landscaped eventually, but we're pretty much done with it. So it could be open space. Utility backfill. Well, we know what that is, right? We dug a trench, we put in our utility, maybe a water line, sewer line, um, and we backfilled it. So the moment it's backfilled, it needs to have an effective soil cover. We don't have 14 days and completed lots. That would be for like a subdivision. So when the lots are completed, they need to have an effective soil cover, which hopefully is the landscaping uh, that goes in there. So uh, it's not necessarily we got this period of time where we can leave nothing there. We need to have an effective soil cover. Of course, after 14 days of inactivity, everything needs to have a uh, effective soil cover. Um, and hopefully you're thinking about that before the rains come in. Now, that was a CGP's perspective. Let's talk about the typical municipal perspective. And again, we go to a typical ordinance, which might read something like this. No person shall cause or allow the continued existence of a condition on any site that is causing or is likely to cause accelerated erosion as determined by the director of building. All disturbed surfaces resulting from grading operations shall be prepared and maintained to control erosion. This control may consist of effective planting such as ryegrass, barley, or some other fast germinating seed. The protection for the slopes shall be installed as soon as practicable and prior to calling for final inspection. 
Now, you know, uh, some ordinances may say that I actually copied it from an actual ordinance, but others are much more succinctly stated and say you will comply with the construction general permit. But one way or another, most municipalities have something that says you're not going to leave it bare dirt. We need to have an effective soil cover of some sort on it. And so, um, uh, with that said, let's talk then about what is erosion. Well, here's the definition. And it's really one word that we point to, and that's the word detached. It's when particles become detached. Now, they can become detached by different things, of course, water, stormwater, but also wind, as we'll see here in a moment. Gravity, big cat dozers, traffic, you're just walking across it can, can uh, cause erosion uh, to happen. And so when that particle becomes detached, it's free to travel. And that's, that's what we're trying to control. So while it's attached, our erosion control measures are dealing with it. When it becomes detached, it now becomes the job of the sediment control measures to deal with it. So here's uh, the types of erosion. There's actually five and in order in the, in the way they progress, it starts with the raindrop. Now, if you come to my QSP, QSD classes, I show a video called Junior Raindrop. It's an old cartoon, came out uh, about a decade after the Dust Bowl to teach uh, soil conservation techniques. It's a lot of fun. So we talk about Junior Raindrop, but each raindrop that hits the ground is like a little bomb hitting it and it causes erosion. So we call that splash erosion or raindrop erosion. That's the first form of erosion. Then as those raindrops come together, they form a thin film of water moving across the surface. And last hour, Mike talked about how a slope will all of a sudden start to look like somebody's dumped a bunch of aggregate on it. Well, they didn't do that. What you are is a victim of sheet erosion. Sheet erosion stolen all your small particles and left the big ones in its wake. And so uh, you, you can lose tons, literally tons of sediment due to sheet erosion under your nose and not even know it. Uh, then real erosion is the third one where uh, after those sheet, that sheet erosion has traveled 20 to or 10 to 20 feet, that's when we see uh, the rills start to form. And last hour, we we're looking at the slope and we we're commenting on on that's why we put in those linear sediment controls to uh, stop that. And when the rills come together, we get bigger rills called goalies. And uh, now we got some real problems, but that's not the issue. That's the symptom. This, the issue is what was happening to keep Junior from hitting the ground. Uh, and so uh, we needed an effective soil cover. And then, Downstream in the watershed, we can get even other forms of erosion, which are, you know, affecting the channel or the stream bank erosion. So those are the five stages of erosion as we go through them. And it starts with, with the raindrop moving at a pretty good clip. It causes some, some uh, uh, particles to break out. Now, one raindrop, not a big deal, but billions of them? Now, now it adds up, now it, it really adds up. Uh, so we want to, that's why effective soil cover is so important. Now let's talk about wind erosion a little bit too. And there's a lot of similarities. Now I call them the three S's of wind erosion. It's saltation, soil creep and suspension. Uh, different forms of wind erosion, but there's some similarities to water erosion here. Saltation. If you speak Spanish, you know the one of the verbs for jump is saltar, which means to jump, or it probably comes from the Latin. Uh, and so saltation is that jumping particle. It's a, a soil particle that is maybe light enough or the wind velocity is big enough, high enough to get it airborne. And it stays up for a while, but then gravity takes over, it comes down, hits the ground, and does basically the same thing as a raindrop. And it breaks loose other particles. The uh, next form is soil creep. Now this particle is either too big or the wind velocity is not high enough. It doesn't get airborne, but it does scoot across the surface. And that scooting causes um, 
causes uh, uh, friction to happen. So both saltation and soil creep are what I call self-propagating erosion, that it's causing more erosion to happen. And, and that friction and that bouncing of the particles are breaking other particles free, making them become detached and, that, and creating a bigger problem as we watch it. The, the third S is the one everybody thinks of. It's the dust cloud suspension. And that dust cloud carries those fines and it can carry them not just off your pro project, but sometimes miles, if not hundreds of miles away uh, that that dust cloud can travel. So how do we deal with wind erosion? Number one way, somebody put it in the chat, see if you're awake after lunch. Number one way we deal with wind erosion. One word actually is what I'm looking for. What do we use? Water, exactly, water. What does water do for us? Well, it weighs the soil down. It uh, uh, also causes it to that hydrostatic pressure to hold down. So the wind's not picking up the particles. It's not causing them to roll. Um, and we're, we're preventing it, uh, all three of those from happening. When we don't use water, we can use other things like uh, uh, using uh, soil binders. Uh, one common soil binder is magnesium chloride, sometimes called mag chloride. It's a salt. And what that really is, is just a, is a microscopic water truck. Because what does salt do? Salt grabs moisture out of the air. So if there's humidity in the air, it doesn't work great in a desert environment. But where there's any, any bit of a humidity, salt grabs it out of the air and basically wets the soil down. Uh, now, you got to be careful with that. Can't use that close to a, a, a sensitive water body. You know, obviously, salts going off site can kill plants and damage uh, sensitive environments. Uh, but there's other soil binders that are more environmentally friendly, such as ones that use uh, natural glues, as we'll see when we go out in the field with Mike, uh, like psyllium, guar, uh, gums, and those types of things. Uh, uses that basically to, to glue the particles down. But an excellent way to control uh, wind erosion in certain circumstances is, is to uh, um, uh, scarify the soil, to actually disturb the soil, to rip the soil. And that's a great way to control uh, wind erosion. And you go, wait a minute, that sounds counterintuitive to disturb the soil improves it? Well, we live out here in the Lodi area, Northern California. I don't know where everybody's calling in from, but we're wine country here. Uh, and there's a lot of vineyards around here, but they also grow other crops. Uh, like this time of the year, the dairy farmers are harvesting their corn crops. And uh, we call it corn shopping. So they, after they take the combine to it, then they disc everything up. And uh, um, during this time of the year, the soils are very dry and it's all broken up. We just recently had a big wind event a week or two ago and I was driving home. And when I would drive by a vineyard, tons of dust, huge dust clouds, sometimes so dusty you couldn't even see across the road, was uh, blowing from the vineyards. You would think that's relatively wind sheltered, big mature vineyards. You know, vines, uh, you'd be relatively wind sheltered, but I saw tons of dust. Then I would drive by a hundred acre plot that had just been freshly plowed up, dry as a bone, no visible dust coming off of it. Why is that? Well, let's go back to our three S's. The jumping particle, saltation. What happens when it hits a void, when it hits a depressed area? Boom, in, game over, right? It's, it's done, it's game over uh, for that jumping particle. How about the scooting particle, the soil creep? Same thing, when it's a depressed area, it's out of play too. We've just knocked out two of the S's. The third S is suspension, and it's a function of surface area exposed to the wind. And if we have soil that's been um, uh, dissed up, we have a lot of low spots that are relatively wind protected. So we've even reduced the, the, the wind exposure. So obviously you can't scarify a site that's ready to move into landscaping or something like that. But in certain circumstances, scarifying the soil might be a great way to control dust and water conservation too. And that's important during these drought times. We're not gonna really go into Russell a whole lot here, uh, but there, 
in the Russell equation, uh, we're solving for soil loss and the amount of uh, 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 sediment we could lose from a job site. So it's measured in uh, in tons and it's expressed uh, uh, annually uh, uh, per acre, uh, at an average acre of soil loss actually per year expressed in tons. It's equal to first factor is the rosivity factor, the R factor. And that's just a factor about where your project's located and when it's happening. So if you have your project happening during the dry season, you're not gonna have as much soil loss as if it's during the wet season. If your project's happening in Southern California, where they get a lot more energy in their storms, you're not gonna get as much soil loss if everything else is consistent as the one in Northern California because the R factor is less. K is the next factor, it's a soil erodibility factor. And there's the three soil textures, right? Sand, silt, and clay. Which one do you think is the most erodible? Sand, silt, or clay? Anybody wanna take a guess, throw it in the chat? Sand, silt, and clay? Silt, and that's it. In fact, uh, yeah, lots of times we do see sand. Now I will tell you, sand will produce the most impressive erosion features. <laughs> but sand, with sand, you know where the sand is at after you have that giant gully? Right there at the foot of the gully. It, it didn't really go anywhere. It's right there. It might have gave you a good photo op, but it's right there. It didn't go far. Clay is the smallest particle. And a lot of people say, yeah, clay is going to be our biggest problem not under normal conditions. Clay wants to stay cohesive, right? It's clay, it wants to stick together. Now, when clay is broken up, it's our worst nightmare. We get a colloidal clay suspension and none of those BMPs we're talking about today are gonna to help you. Silt is the right answer because still, silt is still a pretty small particle, but it's footloose and fancy free and it's going to travel. And so if we're in a silty environment, we're gonna have a higher soil loss. LS is a function of the length of slope and steepness slope. And you know, longer slope, steeper slope, we're gonna have more soil loss. But the last two factors are in green. And they're in green because they're different than the other three. The other three, we're just stuck with them. It is what it is. We're not gonna change it a whole lot for your site. But those last two, you can do something about. And that's what we're gonna talk about outside is a cover factor and a practice factor what we do to the site, how we put in that effective soil cover, that will enable us to do something with it. So uh, here's uh, the cask uh, list of BMPs, erosion control BMPs shown in the yellow there. And uh, there's actually a commonality among them all, uh, most of them anyways. And I don't know if anyone sees it, what is the commonality? Well, if you look at them, they all have something to do with a cover, either preserving an existing cover and protecting it, or doing the project when it doesn't matter if the cover is removed, or putting a temporary cover down, or a permanent cover. So most of them have something to do with a cover, and that's what erosion control is all about. So, Mike, we're going to go back out to you, to the sandbox, and... Uh, have you talked to us? So have Danny turn on. All right, I see he's doing that. I'm going to spotlight him here. So give me a second here. And all right. Uh, you good to Mike. Go? Yeah, I can okay. see you and hear you. You're good to go. All right, sounds good. Okay, thanks, John. Um, yeah, I'm kind of a, an older guy. So the Zoom thing, we're just trying to figure out. Uh, I just got rid of my flip phone about uh, two years ago. My kids gave me such grief, I had to update to something different. So, well, anyway, so we'll transition to uh, covers. We have some temporary uh, covers out here and we have some permanent covers. This one is probably the least expensive that we recommend as a temporary control measure because this is um, oat straw. And the great thing about oat straw is, well, it used to be seven to $10 a bale and and now it's probably 20 to $30 a bale, depending on where you get it. But it's easy to scatter, it's quick, uh, it's inexpensive, doesn't take much labor to get it done. And as you can see, 
if you see look over in this, this area, just from the little bit of rain that's popped up, uh, we've already got some growth popping up in this. So it kind of, it works really well as a temporary cover and it's very inexpensive in the scheme of things. So um, that's one thing. And that's one of the things that we recommend all the time. So now I'm gonna walk over to um, several different types and we'll talk about them kind of as we go. So now what you're looking at here is pine duff. And the pine duff came from the fact that we've got three pine trees out front. And so we brought this back here and this is a great cover. And so the question that we get asked sometime is, well, this uh, is a temporary cover. Is this a temporary cover or a permanent cover? And the answer is both. Um, in certain locations like Tahoe, uh, we are in uh, Yosemite Valley. You can't transfer this pine duff from one location to the next, but if it's native, uh, it can fall into um, a permanent cover. It's used all over Yosemite and it's used in Tahoe. Now, one of the things that we found out only from an inspector that was from the Tahoe Basin area is that they don't want this pine duff to be too close to homes uh, for fire hazard. But other than that, it's a great inexpensive, we've got it in here by about two to three inches. It took us maybe 15 minutes to get it up and to get it in a wheelbarrow and get it back here. It's really effective. You can see things are starting to grow through it. So that's a great, great tool. Uh, the next one we have is just uh, sod. And so the sod really is growing well. We watered a couple of times a day and it really just has taken off. The secret to this is that we put compost underneath the sod. So this compost to the north of the sod is actually what's underneath it. So anytime you're gonna put a growing media you need to really consider what the soil is. Do you need to amend the soil? Um, that kind of thing. So we put about two to three inches of compost here. We picked this compost up from uh, Central Valley Waste. They have a facility in Lathrop. The great thing about this is that we've talked about um, using compost in different locations. And some of the questions were brought up about, well, uh, what if it has some evasive seed in it? Well, what we found out um, in this facility is that this is heated up so much that uh, they told us it's probably 99% of the seed has, has uh, been removed as just far as being baked because this compost just heats up and heats up and heats up uh, as it gets turned over and turned over. It's quite fascinating to go down and see the whole process that they use. If you were standing here as I am, you could see that this is really a great product. And it is, a, it is a, oh, by the way, a permanent cover. So you don't have to worry about putting anything on top of this. It acts as a permanent cover. It will probably, you could have some soil loss with wind when you first put it down because it is pretty fine, but it seems to compact pretty well, pretty quickly. It acts as a sponge, actually. Uh, one in, or two inches of compost will absorb up to the first inch of rain. And, and if, earlier this week, we had a workshop with uh, Craig Kalaji right. talking about a compost blanket. Now, a lot of people think compost blanket and they're gonna think about yeah. like something we're gonna show here. The compost blanket is not something you roll out, it's something that you lay down as a effective soil cover over your site. So you actually blow it on with a big blower truck, right? Right. And put it on and ideally you want, you know, two to four inches of sure. it, uh, but it's a great BMP. And the things that have grown, that are growing on top of it now are just the things that have blown in uh, across, seeds, yeah. Yeah, across the, uh, our construction sandbox. So yeah, it's a great product. And once it starts to kind of absorb some moisture, it just really compacts. And so uh, you can kind of see that. See the, how rich it is. It actually acts as a good growing media uh, where you can um, then uh, establish your, your hydro seed on there or, or uh, whatever you want, your vegetation that you're wanting to put on there. Uh, that's a problem at a lot of sites where the soils are just infertile. They don't have the organic content. And so we're wanting to establish vegetation. Sometimes we got to lay down a compost blanket to be able to get good vegetation to grow. Like that grass right there out here. We'd never grow that grass without the compost it's sitting on. No, this ground is as hard as a rock and it's got a lot of rock in it. And so one of the things that we know for sure, because we've experienced it, 
is that if you're on a slope, for instance, this is uh, needs to be controlled possibly with some kind of a, a blanket underneath it to to attach to to adhere to because otherwise, you know, we've seen some sloughing in it. But if you're like we are on this flat piece of ground, this is a great media and it's a permanent BMP. So, so it looks you terrific. stabilize soil, you reduce runoff, right. you uh, provide a media for your vegetation to grow. It's it's a it's it's a great BMP. It does cost some money. It does cost some money. It adds some money to your, your erosion control dollars, but I think we bought two tons of this for $50. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I don't know in the scheme of, of all the things that has to be purchased, but for sure, we've got sites that have, have the same kind of soil or worse soil than ours. And if, if they don't use anything the, as a growing media, nothing's going to grow there. We've seen that. We've been all evidence right. of that. Well, tell us where we got this. So this is great. Uh, this happened because we had a job up in uh, Colfax and the big storm came through, as you'll remember, last winter. And so this is just mulched up trees. It's just ground up trees. And we asked Caltrans permission because there was a mountain full of it. If we could have a truckload and they said, yeah, absolutely help yourself because we're going to have to figure out what to do with it. So we got a truckload and put it down. Now, this is considered a permanent BMP. This is a permanent cover. So you don't have to do anything else but this. So that's that's great to know. This was inexpensive for us. It just cost us the fuel to go up the hill and, and back down. Right, right, very durable. You want probably a minimum of a one inch depth, but more ideally two inches. Yeah. Uh, and it, it is not compost. That's no. a big misconception. A lot of people think they use them interchangeably. They call this compost. We call this wood mulch. Wood mulch. Now it will compost over time. Mm -hmm naturally and in fact they use this material to create that uh at the uh uh Recycling facility center. yeah mm -hmm. that's 100 percent recycled green waste which is basically this but this is not technically compost it's wood mulch wood mulch okay this next product is because we not only want to show things that we think are effective and that work well we want to show things that are out there that people use so this, of course, our ground is so hard that we couldn't drive the stakes in, as you can see, the staples. And so also what you have to realize is this is a cocoa mat. So this is full of, of coconut, coconut fibers. fibers. And then it's also in plastic uh, monofilament, monofilament netting. netting. So we wanted to, we, we put this out here so that we just could show you a good, good results and something that may not work so well. Now, I've talked to people about this blanket and they say, well, in an emergency situation, it's nice, we can roll it right out, it covers the soil. And I think that's correct. But in the um, long term, we know that this isn't great because this monofilament will break down and become these little plastic nurdles and it'll just be all over the place before you can uh, much think about and it. Entrapment, entrapment, entrapment certainly. and it's just garbage. Um, now, we, we installed this. Some of the reasons we do this out here is not just education, but to actually test things out. This got installed when? June? June. Yeah. This June. So this and has it already been... already looks like this? Yeah. So we this haven't is... even gone through a wet season yet. No, we had just a small amount of rain the other day, and uh, yeah, nothing. So we wanted to show you plus and minuses, and then, you know, what we always say all the time is we have a toolbox full of all kinds of tools. Some things work well in certain conditions, some things don't. If this is all you have and you need to get some soil covered, I would say use this if you have nothing else. But if you look at long term, especially with maintenance, you're going to have a heck of a time when all this starts to degrade and break down. Well, this next product that we're looking at is jute. So we've heard it called, um, you know, jute mat, jute, um, jute, mesh. jute mesh. It's been called several different things, but it really is an effective product. What we've seen too is that we talked to the hydro seeders about this product and there was a little bit of a misunderstanding on our part about where do you put the hydro seed down first, this on top and, uh, you know, or, or vice versa. And they said, no, you want to put this down first, the seed on top, because otherwise we take a chance on, on killing the, the seed underneath before it has a time to really grow. So um, now John will point out that this installation is not perfect because if you came up on top of this hill, what's the problem, John? If you just well, try to go over this knoll? One of the problems with blankets is that they can hide erosion problems. And so, especially at the top of the hill, you want to key it in or here where we're going up and over a mound, maybe put some dirt down on this end so that we don't get 
flow going underneath our blanket, causing rills and gullies. That we don't even in know fact, exist. If you're an inspector, you need to be careful uh, because you can have some deep gullies hidden by your erosion control measures. Uh, but uh, you want to prepare your ground. You want to have good level or, or conformance of the blanket to Certainly. the ground, a rocky environment, a, a real undulated, you know, uneven uh, slope is not ideal. Right. Uh, uh, but you want it to be right onto the ground. That way, if you do go to hydro seed on top of it, the plants are able to go right to the ground immediately. Uh, so yeah, you want to want to uh, uh, pay attention to how you install this, where you use it. Now, if you got a real steep slope, this is a really good step to do. First thing you do is you put in your trenching for your linear sediment controls that okay. we talked about last sure. hour. Then you roll this out. Then you install your fiber rolls along the slope. Over the, the top slope. of it. Then you spray mm -hmm. typically a two-step process at least. First, get your seed down with a light hyd hydro mulch sure. layer, and then maybe uh, a heavier hydro mulch layer on top of that to protect it. I went on a job uh, this last winter where this was used and it was a, a, a crazy steep slope. And um, down at the bottom, the fellows just laid over some huge rocks, which I thought, well, it looks nice, yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't too effective. Nothing grew up out of it, but uh, underneath that uh, pile was some rocks. So anyway, so yeah, this is a great product. Now, this product is thought to be people pretty well, they don't like this. Yeah, it gets some bad It gets some publicity. bad rap. Yeah. But to be honest with you, we've seen some situations like we had um, a job we were inspecting up in the northern Sacramento area where they had uh, colloidal clays. And so this particular job site knew that it wasn't going to dry out anytime soon because it was a couple years ago when we had those rains just back to back to back. And so what they would do is they would take the plastic and they would roll it out and cover their site. And their site wasn't big. It was before probably the rain was before in. the rain was coming. It was about an acre, maybe. So they would cover it with plastic. The rain would come. And then when the rain stopped, they'd just roll it up, move it out of the way, and they were able to work. And so their job site remained relatively dry. It probably only had maybe 5 to 10% of moisture on it. So it was really effective. We were quite amazed at watching the whole process. But it really worked great. The drawback to this product in general is that people put it down and they walk away from it. They never come back to it. And they come back to it maybe six months later and there's a thousand pieces of it everywhere because it's gone to plastic nurdles, it's disintegrated. You can look at this here. We've had this here since June. And so we're like, oh, it's still pretty pliable. So it's still pretty pliable. And, but it doesn't mean that we can leave this out here for five or six months, especially if we have anywhere near that 115 kind of degree days oh, there. Yeah. It'll just chew it up. We'll, we've seen too. We've we've played with it out here. We'll see that one day it's fine, and the next day it's not. It's not. It's like all of a sudden. So yeah, you don't don't think you're gonna, you know, be able to get out there before it falls apart. I mean, it could fall apart in a day. Yes, yeah, so we've been out here before, uh, only by experience with our vacuum, our vacuum bags vacuuming this mess up because it is just disintegrated. And we were like, I just saw it last week. But anyway, just um, be aware that. This product, or actually any product, just takes maintenance. You've got to keep an eye on it, see how it's doing. Some that are permanent, you don't have to really you know, manage that much. They seem to kind of take care of themselves. Other things, you've got to just make sure they're doing a now, good job. One of the other things, so you got to pay attention to when using plastic and mitigate it is, remember, the enemy of erosion is high velocity. Certainly. And so when you have a stockpile like you see behind us that's covered with plastic, what you got is a giant slip and slide, right? Without a doubt. Uh, the, the ranger, junior raindrop and his gang is going to come sliding down there really fast. High rate of speed. And and we can then get erosion not on the pile, but downgrading of the pile once you hit something that's permeable, like, uh, you know, soil. Then when it leaves the plastic, it hits the soil. That's where erosion can happen. So you want to mitigate that with good sediment control devices certainly that's why we put a perimeter around the stockpile not so much to keep the stockpile from spreading although that helps but it's really to slow the flow or you know mitigate that fast flow coming off that plastic line stockpile um, is, is a good reason to do that but you know keep this in your toolbox a lot of people want to throw it out get rid of it 
Now, there's some great places to use this, commercial developments like you were telling Certainly. us about. Uh, we've even seen uh, municipal, uh, like road work, uh, if they're putting in an island or, or on the shoulder, lots of times they'll roll it out before an anticipated storm, then roll it back up after the storm's over and continue work. Sure, it makes good sense. It makes good sense. So now let's roll over here to this area that we have uh, hydro mulched. And well, we didn't do it, we had it done. Uh, so some folks came out and basically sprayed this for us. So one of the things that we learned, and John can attest to this, is when you are putting a SWIP together, what do you call out for um, you know, measures of, of hydro seed or hydro mulch yeah, quantities? Um, and we're gonna look at some different types here in a moment, but uh, you wanna specify the application. And typically, um, on a flat site like we're on, I'm gonna go with like 1500 pounds per acre. Um, you know, there's other things you wanna look at is, you know, how much traffic is it going to get or abuse is it gonna get? Uh, is there something really sensitive we need to protect? So, uh, but you might, you might bring that up. On a hillside, typically I'll go with 3,500 uh, pounds per acre uh, uh, application, which is usually be done on a two, two or three step process to apply that uh, mount on there. And how they apply it is with a cannon or a hose. Um, now- uh, And what do you they, mean by a two or three step? Uh, uh, basically uh, lay down one layer first, uh, maybe, at, uh, maybe they're going with, I don't know, a thousand uh, pounds per acre of, of material. Sure. And let that dry while they're hitting the rest of the site. And after it's cured up a little bit, then they'll lay another layer. It's just like painting, right? Certainly. If you're gonna put two coats down, you don't you put two coats one dry. down at <laughs> one time, right? You, otherwise you got a mess on your hands. Yeah. Uh, so the same thing, if they put too much on, it's just, glo you know, you get globs of it. And it, and when the next part hits, it split, you know, spreads it out. Actually, if you took real, real close look at this, it's a little less than ideal. And the reason was, this is not an ideal place to do hydro mulch because if it's a small area using the cannon, uh, that's meant for large distances. And, uh, and they were really trying to elevate their spray and just let it kind of fall. So it was quite the challenge having a truck, you know, 30 feet from where we're spraying yeah. versus uh, what they usually do. Now we've learned a lot from the hydro seeders that have come here about um, what things should look like when a truck shows up and then when a truck leaves. Right. Um, <laughs> Uh, we, I, I'll never forget uh, one of our students that was here um, said, hey, yeah, that looked just like my site. And, and uh, the person said, well, then that was about 500 pounds per acre. And, and she's like, what? I paid for 3,500 pounds per acre. No, that, if it looked like that, that was about 500 pounds per acre. <laughs> and a big lesson, you need to pay attention to what's being applied on your site. And how do you do that? Counting the bags. Yeah. Yeah, you count the bags. We'll show them some bags here in a moment. Sure. But if you're a QSP or you're in charge of making sure that erosion control measure is being applied appropriately, part of it is some accounting and counting the bags. Of course, use use a reputable firm, someone you know that you trust and Certainly. it's going to do a good job for you. But make sure that you're getting the coverage that you've specified. The hydro seeder that we have had um, come and, and, and share experiences with them also told me on a slope, he would spray up the hill and then he would go to the top and his next spray would be down the hill. So he, he said, because you'll hit uh, some of the, the mulch will hit and create a little uh, dimple behind it. And he says, there won't be anything there. So he said, you want to spray it in a couple different directions. Let's go show him some of these uh, uh, mulches. Sure. So one of the things they'll notice though, is out here it's brown and maybe a lot of our class, when they think hydro seeding or hydro mulch, they're thinking that greenish, you know, that aqua green color. Right. right. Um, that was that color before. Uh, a lot of people don't know it, but that color is just a uh, dye, basically an indicator, so they know where they sprayed. And it's made out of a kelp product, natural product out of kelp that is photosensitive. And so it changes colors when exposed to light. In fact, you'll see some of that here. As we look in some of these bags, you'll notice that like on the top, it's turned brown. But if I break into it, you see that nice green product because this has been exposed to sunlight. But uh, Mike, let's let's 
look at some of these products here, uh, all of these are uh, mulches, Every, hydraulic mulches. Hydraulic mulches, yes, all of them. And uh, there's different types like bonded fiber matrix, which uh, uh, this is a, a, a bonded fiber matrix. And so bonded fiber matrix can have seed or not have seed. It could be both. Right, right. Uh, these uh, mulches, they're basically the carrier. Um, that's a, a misconception a lot of people, it's a lot of people just call it all hydro seed. Well, hydro seed is the hydraulic mulch and you have all sorts of options. In fact, we have maybe eight here. Um, there's, there's dozens more options. But when you add the seed, which we have a bag down at the end here of seed, so when we add the seed to the mix, in fact, here you can see what's in the seed right here, different types of fescues and clovers uh, in here. Uh, that is in the uh, hydro seed. It has the carrier, it has the, the, the fiber yep. and the glutes. Right here we have, um, well, I mixed this this morning. It's already gluey. Uh, this is psyllium. So you can see how gluey that is. I mixed it this morning. Look how elastic that is. Yeah. Uh, so you add the, the fiber, the, the cellulose, uh, and that comes in different forms. It could be wood, it could be paper, mm -hmm. it could be uh, straw. straw. Um, and then you add in the glues, uh, natural glue, and then you add in your seed, and then that's hydro seed. If it's a permanent installation, that's what you want to do. You want to include the seed. Surely. If it's temporary and you're going to disturb that area, don't don't spend the money on the seed. Just use the mulch, the hydraulic mulch. And there's different types. There's uh, uh, BFM. Mm -hmm. There's flexible growth media that uh, has more give and allows the plant to punch through a little easier. There's a couple of products on the market. There's one product on the market that we saw perform really well. I was quite surprised. The site was damp. And they came and sprayed it with the site damp and it just sealed it up. This one's pretty neat. It's got a mix of already uh, some of that uh, uh, mulch, or I'm sorry, that compost. Oh, uh -huh. it. And it's got the fiber and it's even got some uh, fertilizers in here already. Uh, and then this one is made out of straw and, and uh, glues in there. And so you can see, see what that looks before they mix it up. And once they get it wet, it gets real sticky. So you can kind of see this gets pretty sticky just by adding a little water to it. it was a good job. All right. Well, I'm going to go back in and. Uh, OK, go ahead. Talk a little bit more about uh, when we would use these, when we want to apply it. There's a certain time of year you want to apply it and a certain time of year you don't want to apply it. Yeah, we didn't, we weren't completely aware of the exact time we would, I would always have thought just reasoning, oh, you want to spray it right before the rainy season, because then the rains are going to come and it's going to germinate and, and uh, work really well. And uh, basically our hydro seeder, and of course, I've heard a couple of different stories, said in the springtime that this is better right kind of at the tail end of the rains, because um they think that that's the best time to pour. And I don't know, like I say, I've heard both time, both, both cases. I know for instance, we have uh, BFM will be sprayed as a temporary control uh, measure. A lot of times it doesn't have any seed in it. So if they're leaving a site, well, for instance, uh, a stockpile, I know a project that has a stockpile that the stockpile is gonna remain there for six months. And then they're gonna use the soil when they're done to be able to uh, work back on the site. It's needed in certain locations. And so they sprayed a BFM over it and it kind of encapsulated it. And um, that helped them to be able to not lose the pile by dust or whatever. And they didn't put any plastic on it. So it was really effective. So there is just different products for different reasons. And um, anyway, I think it's about time to wrap all up right. and turn it over to John. All right, thank you, Mike. Okay, so, uh, all right, great. Let me um, grab the uh, spotlight back, all right. And start my... Just give me a second here. Um, all right. Okay, let's um let's go ahead and go back to um a second here. 
All right, there we go. There's my video. All right, let's go ahead and uh, go back to our presentation and, and finish it up there. And uh, this would be a great time if you have questions, if you haven't already done so, to uh, type them in uh, for us. Uh, like in the last hour, we'll, we'll answer some of those questions right now. Let me open that up so I can see it. And uh, all right, great. So let's look at some actual uh, real life situations here. Um, all right, let me go back here. Okay, so um, here you see a real life situation that actually Mike took a picture of just last week. Uh, this was a result of those storms that we, or that storm that we had just a couple weeks ago. And uh, it's, uh, here in the Delta, it was actually a levee project. Uh, but take a look at this. The, now this site did a wonderful job of putting down a uh, blown straw with a tackifier on it. Uh, it looks like adequate coverage for the most part. They had um, good linear sediment controls installed here. But look at this disaster. Uh, what happened here? Well, if you follow it up, where does it start? It starts right up here towards the end of that pickup truck. Well, this is a case of not understanding how water flows and not understanding which tools you should be reaching for in your toolbox. Now, they spent a fair amount of money uh, putting this BMP down. You know, they didn't really save on cost uh, on, the, on the installation, but it, it was a, a massive failure, as you can see. But the reason for the failure is, is that they didn't understand that they also have to have run-on protection. So fortunately, uh, I didn't write the uh, SWIP for this project, um, but uh, the SWIP writer really kind of dropped the ball on this unless somebody didn't install it. But right up here where that pickup truck's at, I'm willing to bet that there's a curb opening and they were getting concentrated flow coming off that roadway and uh, onto the site right there. And basically the run on was causing the problem. Now in these three workshops, we're not so much dealing with run on. We, we haven't really um, spent a lot of time on that, but your run on can definitely cause problems. So how would we uh, deal with this? Well, first off, recognize the points of concentrated flow and mitigate those. Uh, both Caltrans and Casca have uh, BMPs that address those. Uh, one that might have been really good in this place would be to have a temporary downslope pipe, basically to uh, intercept that, that uh, point and walk it down the, the hill in a pipe and release it with some velocity dissipation would be a good deal. Uh, this could also be an engineering issue uh, where we're, even after the grass has grown in, we're going to still see this problem happen. Uh, and so this might be a, a situation where we go back to the design team and go, um, you know, well, we got an issue here. We need to not only deal with it during construction, but after construction, how are we going to deal with this run on here? So that is uh, uh, something we would want to take a uh, look at. Um, Here's another uh, site. Uh, actually, Mike and I worked on this site. This was one of ours. And uh, here we see a beautiful job of, up in the Sierras of laying down some good hydraulic mulch and hydro seed. Uh, it's on a flat uh, place where some remedial activities had occurred. Uh, and uh, this picture was from last October, I believe. But now, to a picture about two weeks ago, what does that area look like? Well, not as vegetated as we would have hoped. And uh, the reason here is that um, the, the fertile soils just were non-existent down there, probably because of the remedial excavations they had to do uh, down there. They brought up probably a lot of uh, lower um, soil from the um, lower layers that had less organic material that was relatively infertile. And uh, we did get some vegetation, some uh, uh, germination, 
but uh, plants never got real strong and healthy because there just wasn't enough uh, gro uh, growing material. Now, in this case, we suggested that they had gone, had used compost, but maybe because of the location, they decided not to. Fortunately, we got a notice of termination with this, so um, we were a little surprised too, but uh, they did get an NOT and they're out of the permit. And of course, eventually, what will happen in an area like this is we'll get enough uh, of that pine up there and it will, um, um, I'm sure in the next year or two, be much more um, productive as far as vegetation. And I think I have one more. Here's a good example of uh, linear sediment controls and also sprayed material. All right, I see some questions. Let's, let's go to some questions here. Uh, all right, let me go back here and see what we got here. Um, what do you mean, or how long is a temporary control? That's a great question. Um, temporary means um, that we're going to do something else with that area. Uh, that's why we would want to put a temporary down. So let's say that this picture that we're showing right here. The difference between temporary and permanent, if we were looking at it right now, you wouldn't be able to tell. The reason is, is the difference between the, uh, a temporary would be, as we just showed with those bags, it would just be the hydraulic mulch. Permanent would have been if we added in the seed. So at this point, you know, at the end of summer, uh, the seed still lay in dormant, it hasn't germinated, you wouldn't be able to visually tell whether it's temporary or permanent. But if we were going to come back and rework this section later on in the project, we would definitely want to go with only a temporary control measure, and that would be only the BFM or hydraulic mulch material, not the seed, unless, unless it, uh, there were extenuating circumstances or something like that. Uh, but we wouldn't want to go to the expense of adding seed, plus the trouble of having to just strip off that vegetation later. Uh, so temporary means usually that we're going to come back and work it again. We just need to have an effective soil cover down until we get back to it. Uh, permanent means we're going to leave it there. So yeah, good question. Um, just checking on time. We got about five minutes left. Uh, uh, the to the 2022 uh, fact sheet says, dischargers shall use biodegradable wattles containing no plastic that can remain on a site when possible. Yeah, uh, uh, wattles containing plastic netting, including plastic specified as photodegradable, become trash in the environment and or trap wildlife. I agree 100% with that. I just wish they would have stripped the words when possible and just said you will use biodegradable wattles. Um, uh, because, it, you know, uh, having a uh, loophole like that, uh, you know, leaves it open to interpretation. Uh, you know, I said I don't want any of my BMPs removed from uh, the toolbox, but in this case, I still have a fiber roll. It's a fiber roll with biodegradable covering rather than a monofilament uh, uh, netting. So I much prefer to see that in. But And actually this, this fact sheet is very consistent with one of the FAQs that was in place for the 2009 uh, version as well. Is the jute mat, mat, is the jute mat considered permanent control? Yes and no, it depends how we use it. So if we lay it down and we hydro seed on it, you're going to get all of those grasses and vegetation growing up through it, and it's going to remain there and just degrade and, and go away. Um, if we're just laying it out onto the ground, like to cover a stockpile or something like that, then no, it's not a permanent control. It would need to be removed. Um, but uh, it, in the typical installation, yes, it could be considered permanent. Uh, mul uh, Mel says multi-step spray mulches minimize shadowing by spraying from different directions. Yes, especially on a slope. And a great thing as a as a QSP to do after you've had a hydro mulch installation or hydro seed installation is go to the top of the slope. And sometimes you'll be surprised when you look down you'll see a lot of dirt. In fact, sometimes it won't even look like they sprayed it. 
Um, and which way is the water traveling? From where you're at, right? It's going to take advantage of all those open dirt spots. So very, very important. Good point, Mel, to do that. Excellent. Um, what are the requirements for stabilizing active areas prior to a rain event? What products besides plastic can be applied on short notice? Um, straw, straw can be hand scattered straw for smaller areas can be done very quickly. Geotextiles can be laid out. Um, certain erosion control mats, as you saw, we're not fans of some of them, but certain erosion control mats can also be laid out real quick. Uh, I see a lot of subdivisions, especially in the Bay Area, use geotextiles in the front of the subdivisions, the front of the home lots. Uh, they do that uh, to uh, get some cover out real quick, but they also do it to keep a clean site. It's because they get a lot of foot traffic going from the road to the, the home they're building. And so it keeps the, the, uh, the home clean as well. Uh, so it's also just for, as a good housekeeping. So those are good measures. And uh, maybe this one last one here from the fact sheet, dischargers are required to preserve native topsoil. Yes, we didn't even get into that, uh, but that's a new requirement in the permit to set aside and stockpile your native topsoil uh, so that you can use it. Uh, and and uh, so hopefully you don't have problems reestablishing vegetation. All right, well, I think that's all the time we got for this one. Now the good news is we have another workshop, so you're gonna have to go to the next Zoom address, uh, but uh, we'll go ahead, I'll stop the share, and uh, we'll see you in the next workshop. So okay. be sure to join me for the third one. We'll see you soon.